Welcome to Citizen Talk, the show that's restoring prudence to politics. I'm Juan Davalos. And I'm Lynette Grunvig, and this is Radio Free Hillsdale 101.7 FM. And if you're talking about restoring prudence, Ron, why don't you say what restoring prudence is? Well, uh, well, I'll start with saying what prudence is. And uh, prudence is the ability to know what the right thing to do is uh, at the right time, considering the circumstances. Uh, if we know what the end of what we want to achieve is, we need to look at circumstances to choose what the right means are. And prudence allows one to choose the right means for achieving that end. And also, I guess, knowing what end is achievable and not, depending on those circumstances. Yeah, so like something like destroying the nation's economy so you can make a Green New Deal might not be a prudent decision, right, is what you're saying? Right, right. <laughs> yeah, that, that would be exactly right. I think Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is not great on that issue. <laughs> uh, but w- prudence is extremely important for what we're going to talk about today because we're talking about immigration. Uh, it's a huge topic. We are, um, I guess we've been consumed with this topic for the past two years. Uh, Donald Trump, uh, President Trump made it a part of his campaign. He did. And he's been fighting to get a border wall. Uh, and he says, you can't have a country if you don't have any borders. Uh, and so we're going to be talking about that uh, today. We've invited Dr. Matthew Spaulding. Uh, Dr. Spaulding is the Associate Vice President and Dean of Educational Programs for Hillsdale College in Washington, D.C. And so as such, he oversees the operations of the Kirby Center in the various academic and educational programs of Hillsdale in the nation's capital. Uh, welcome to the show, Dr. Spaulding. It's good to be with you guys. Dr. Spalding, so I guess being in D.C., you probably have a more insider look to what's going on in immigration. But um, just to let, <laughs> hopefully at least, <laughs> uh, but just to let our uh, listeners know what we're going to do with the show is we're going to talk a little bit about the principles uh, regarding immigration, what the founders thought about it, uh, sure. what's involved in immigration. And then we want to get more into the, the details, the nitty gritty of things. Um, so what should what should we think uh, when we talk about immigration? In our show, we have talked about social compact theory uh, and how that affects, you know, the people of a country. Uh, so what should we think when we think about immigration? Uh, well, that's, <laughs> um, it, there's, there's a lot of things to think about. And, and, and I, I love the, the, the way you're approaching this uh, as a prudential matter. Because, of course, in Washington, D.C., if there's one thing that's lacking, it's a potential understanding of politics. Right. Um, and you're right. I mean, immigration is one of the best ways to, to reflect on that. Uh, if, for no other reason, it shows you the, the imprudence in many ways of uh, oftentimes both sides of the equation. Right? I mean, right. And, uh, the issue also points us back to the great prudence of the founding itself. I mean, you know, I, I've been involved with the immigration debates, uh, not just uh, the current round, but this is something for probably the last 20 years or so I've, I've worked on uh, and, and written about it at great length, precisely because I, I always thought that the immigration question is important itself, but, but more important, the way to go back to and revive a discussion about what America means. Right, in, that's a good say, point. The Declaration of Independence, right? I mean, it's because when, when you think about it that way, the, the idea of immigration, of, of uh, someone going from one country to another country and becoming part of this new country, uh, becoming a citizen, uh, it really turns on a, a fundamental understanding of what America is, because the most I would probably start to actually go back to your question now. The, the, the most important thing to understand about immigration is actually less uh, an abstract principle. And if there were one, I'd probably say it's, it centers around the idea of consent. Mm-hmm. But, but the, the, the primary thing, which and the reason why someone like Trump is interesting on this, is precisely because he raises the question about uh, what it means to be a nation what it means to be a country, or I would more broadly say what what it means to be a regime. The whole idea of a regime that has um, uh, sovereignties, has a nation, has borders, um, and how we understand that. And then the next stage, stage is how is the American regime different from other regimes, which, of course, is exactly what the whole immigration debate is really about. Right. Now, I'm, I'm speaking here as a naturalized citizen, so this question might sound uh, strange coming from me, but I wonder, why have immigration at all? 
Um, well, that's that's a fine question and, and a legitimate question, to which I think there's a a, a good answer, right? I mean, um, I suppose a practical answer is you, you do want to have uh, immigration uh, growth through immigration, uh, and I think we do know historically that for for many nations, uh, you know, the, the the existing population isn't sufficient. So I think there's a general argument about why immigration can be a good thing. But probably the, the better argument, I think, is that um, there's something, and this still goes back to the nature of the American regime as opposed to other regimes. It's not really about numbers, and it's actually not merely about uh, types of immigrants, although that's important, right? It's, just, it's a way to bring in people with certain skills and um, uh, things that can tr- contribute to the well-being of the of the of the new country, but I, but I think actually there is something about the American idea and uh, the idea of of, of of a certain way of thinking about things, of a certain regime of liberty that uh, attracts a certain type of person that uh, practically might, might want to be an entrepreneur, uh, might be looking for religious liberty. Uh, but they're they're attracted in a way that actually makes them not merely a citizen, but actually a good citizen. Mm. And uh, as a regime, that's what we're ultimately looking for, right? Whether they're our own children we raise to be good citizens, or people who um, uh, are not born here but are actually Americans by choice. Uh, I was going to say one of our, uh, at least one of my great friends. You know, I don't know if you guys knew him, but. Uh, Peter Schramm, who was Hungarian and escaped with his father during the Hungarian Revolution, made his way to America. Uh, you always would say he, he was uh, born in America. He, he was born an American, but not in this country. <laughs> I, I, that, that's funny. I've, I, I haven't. Uh, I don't know uh, him personally, but uh, I often say something similar. I wasn't born in this country, <laughs> but I've always been an American. Um, uh, I wanted to. Uh, what you're saying reminds me of a quote of uh, that Washington said. He said, the bosom of America is open to receive not only the opulent and respectable stranger, but the oppressed and persecuted of all nations and religions. And I think that's basically uh, in line with our founding principle, right? We believe that all men are created equal. And what that equality means is that everybody has a right to have their life, liberty, uh, and property protected and pursue happiness Um, and so in that sense, I guess, um, as Americans, we do believe that anybody in the world has the um, opportunity, I guess, to try to be an American, to try and come to be part of our political community. Uh, but I guess there's limits to that. And, and what would you say are some, some limits? Why, why would we limit immigration? Right. So, so it, it, it goes back to that distinction of regimes, which is why I, I, I keep try- wanting to emphasize that, that thing. Uh, because at the heart of the uh, 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 first of all, there's a difference between America and, and other countries, right? So you think of the uh, France or Germany, and uh, you know uh, Reagan was actually very good on this rhetorically, but he he, he always liked to point out that um, anybody can move to Germany um, and actually become a German citizen, but you can never truly become German, hmm. or you can move to France and never become a Frenchman. Right, because those countries are ultimately based on blood. Mm. Right. Uh, but you can, but anybody in theory could come to America and become an American. Right. And that tells us something. So, so you're right. In 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 theory, in principle, anybody can be an American, because we don't uh, we don't discriminate. Uh, we believe that all men are created equal. Um, you know, we can you know go back and read Abraham Lincoln's uh, famous uh, famous Fourth uh, of July speech. I think it was in 18. 18- 58 before before he becomes president about uh, you know he, he's he's lamenting this question about well what about all those people who who are not descendants of the founding fathers that come from other countries uh, and he says you know they they go back and they read that Declaration of Independence and they realize that at that point they are blood of the blood and flesh of the flesh who who, who of those who wrote the Declaration um, so the, the so the principle is anyone who can become an American. Uh, having said that, right, those same principles of human equality, which give rise to consent, mean that 
not that, that, that doesn't follow that everyone has a right to be an American. Right. Um, they 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 uh, they in principle could become an American, but it has to be done in a way that is. Uh, consistent with the same principles, which means it has to be done according to the consent of the American people. Um, and part of that consent means they are coming over here and going through some process, uh, some something consistent with the laws that that country has made, in this case this country has made, by which one uh, enters and then goes down this path of becoming an American, or if not becoming an American, respecting our laws, and then uh, not continuing, right? I mean, you know, the, the, the whole idea of an American regime, uh, and this is always the thing that's debated about immigration, but in many ways about America generally, right, is it's, it's both a universal idea of human equality, but it's also a particular nation. And immigration is, is uh, one of the areas, of which there's others, but one in particular where those two things come together. How do you reconcile a universal truth with a particular uh, truth uh, that has to do with a particular regime and a particular circumstance at a particular time? Well, that's done through the, uh, the process of having laws and rules that are consistent with the principles, but make uh, proper accommodations for what's necessary to go through uh, that process. Broadly speaking, when it comes to the question of becoming an American, right, we have something we've long, long referred to as naturalization. Right. Right. Uh, what, what are the things you must do? So, in, in, in theory, anyone can come, become an American. So, if you choose to to uh, try to do that. Uh, you, there, there are things we believe you have to go through to become naturalized, which is a very term that means to become a citizen as if you were naturally a citizen. Right. I uh, yeah. So go ahead. I'm just curious. So you, we talk about everyone being able to become an American, and I certainly believe that is true, um, as long as they hold to the principles of whatever the American regime we decide are. It's interesting, though, looking at the Federalist Papers, John Jay uh, in the Federalist Papers talks about America having been blessed because we have a similar religion, a similar language, we come from a similar background. And that allows us to create a, a nation with unique circumstances that, that can give rise to liberty. And Benjamin Franklin, of course, was concerned about a lot of the German immigrants in Pennsylvania, that they lacked that background or that understanding to be fully American. So I'm, I'm wondering... What exactly you would say you would need to become an American citizen? Do you need those things, a similar religion, a similar language, uh, a similar intellectual background, cultural background? What, what, what should we be requiring as we look to naturalize people when you think about that from the founding? Well, I, 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 I will say one thing. Um, I will be the uh, strongest of advocates that at the center of what you need to become an American is an understanding of the principles of the American regime, which, which, which by the way, means you must, uh, uh, you, you can still uh, uh, continue to have uh, your uh, uh, self-understanding of what it meant to be a German or whatever country you're coming from, but it, but it does mean actually changing your allegiances and, in the case of some countries, rejecting the principles of a former regime in favor of ours, right? You, you have to be a Republican, small r. Right. Um, so I, I would very much, you know, and we, we can talk well, about further hopefully if you big want, R I mean, also. <laughs> what's that? Hopefully big R also, capital R also. Uh, well, given the debate today, I suppose <laughs> that might be true. But, but obviously that's not a requirement. Right. Um, and we, we can go more there. But I, but I would also be the first to underscore uh, some other things. So the reason uh, uh, the founders, and this includes, you know, you mentioned Franklin and Jay. Um, Hamilton was very concerned about immigration, and so was Thomas Jefferson. And they write, they have various things they write, both write about these, these concerns. So you, you need to somehow become uh, uh, a, a, um, a, a partisan for the principles of the American regime, which means rejection of monarchy and, and um, authoritarianism or whatever it might have been in, uh, when, when you do. But, 
But then coming here, you need to take on certain attributes. Uh, I don't know that that means you have to have a common religion, although the fact that so much of our immigration was coming from Western Europe for so long I think is very important. But it does mean you need to understand the meaning of religious liberty. So religions that are closed to religious liberty, we would have a problem with. Uh, but also, I would, and then I would add uh, a common language. Right. <laughs> our language happens to be English. Does it have to be is it English in principle? Not necessarily. That just happens to be our our language. <laughs> but, the, but the further question is, why do you need a common language? Uh, you need a common language because in a democratic republic, it's important for the citizenry to communicate about the principles and practices of the regime. Right. And if you cannot communicate to the extent that you can have an opinion and vote and read a newspaper and participate, um, you can't be fully assimilated. Mm. Um, and, and I would argue you can't fully work in and become part of the American economic system. And yeah. you, you're bringing up the question of assimilation there, which I think it's crucial because it seems to me that part of the, uh, a big part of the equation of thinking about immigration and how many immigrants we accept into the country a year or, or if we put any limits is that question of assimilation because what you need to do is you need to have people assimilate to your way of life, to your culture, whatever that culture may be. And in this case, we're, we're talking in the United States. Mm -hmm. So therefore, immigrants need to assimilate to that culture in uh, I remember I grew up with a very, uh, you could call it a very Americanized uh, worldview, uh, and I had a basic understanding of uh, the principles of the American country uh, or of the nation before coming to the United States. I came at the age of 17, and I still remember thinking to myself how hard it, uh, it is to assimilate to a new culture. Uh, things that people don't, don't even think about. My, my view of of police officers coming from a from a third world country you know you have this expectation of the police as being uh somewhat corrupt and so you always see them very you know with a very skeptical mindset and changing that when you come to the united states and, and understanding no these are upright citizens that are enforcing the law and understanding that in this country you live under uh, certain laws that were made by the people all those things um take a lot of time actually and so how do you think assimilation plays into our understanding of immigration well I, I, I you're right I think, it, I think it's crucial um, and, and and I would go back to our discussion about the you know you need to know something about the principles of the regime you're, you're going to mm -hmm. and in our case you need to, to know the principles of Republican government uh, which means You, you understand the distinction between where you came from, be it authoritarian or monarchical or whatever it might be, to America. But again, it, it's not, that's not an abstract question. So we give them a civics test. I actually, um, uh, when it was rewritten during the Bush, the Bush II administration, uh, I actually helped rewrite the, the citizenship test. Uh, I took your you test might, then. You might have taken my <laughs> test, uh, which sounds like you passed it. Yes. <laughs> um, and we, we weaved into it more questions about actually regime principles. So rather than just merely telling us what are the colors of the flag, you had to know something about its, its core principles. Uh, but, but having said that, I was just to pursue what you were saying, is the question is how does one really learn those principles? And my point is, You don't learn them simply by studying for a civics test. Right. Um, you learn them by participating. You learn them by being a part of the society and the culture. You learn them by, by, by participating in civic organizations, uh, by, by being in the workforce, uh, by living one's day-to-day -day life by the rules and regulations of, of, a, of, of a city. Right? Right. Mm -hmm. So assimilation... Again, the very word gives us part of the answer, right? It's to, be, it's to become as similar, not the same, but, but similar in a way. Well, in what ways are we similar? Well, I mean, you, you prefer one food, I might prefer another food. Um, you know, uh, my, uh, my uh, ancestors are Irish. Uh, my wife's ancestors are Italian, so she talks with her hands a lot. 
Uh, she seems to be more outgoing, right? That's not what matters. We are similar in the sense that we have uh, an agreement about certain common principles, but also we are similar in the sense that we operate with certain, or we, or we learn to operate with certain common uh, assumptions about essentially the workings of the rule of law, the workings of an economic free market uh, marketplace, uh, about respecting religious liberty, uh, right? Those kinds of things, I would argue, must be similar to the point of, of uh, those things being much, much closely held in common, so that then you can have the diversities that are important ethnically and, and important to our, how we define our lives and our communities, but they're, not, they're, not, they're no longer defining uh, in a way that is, goes to the heart and soul of what it means to be a citizen. Right, and we're going to actually go ahead and take a short break. We've been talking with Dr. Spalding. He's the director of the Kirby Center, part of Hillsdale College in Washington, D.C. We're talking about immigration and how important it is, uh, how, how it was important for the founding, it's important now for the country, but what we need to think about when we're thinking about immigration. Uh, the needs for the country might change as time goes along, and we need to look at those circumstances. So as we come back from the break, we're going to keep talking to Dr. Spaulding a little bit more about the circumstances right now in the country. President Trump just proposed uh, some changes to immigration, so we're going to talk about those. Uh, you're listening to Citizen Talk, the show that's restoring prudence to politics. I'm Juan Davalos. And I'm Lynette Grunvig, and this is Radio Free Hillsdale 101.7 FM. And you can also hear us on SoundCloud, or you can check us out on your podcast app on your iPhone or iPad, and just search for Citizen Talk, all one word. We'll be right back after the break. Welcome back to Citizen Talk. This is the show that deals with prudence and current affairs. And we are here talking to Dr. Spaulding, who is the head of the Kirby Institute, Hillsdale's program out in Washington, D.C. And we are here speaking to him about the topic of immigration and what the principles are behind that in, in any country and in the United States in particular, but also in how we're handling it today. And I wanted to ask you, Dr. Spaulding, uh, Donald Trump has recently proposed some new immigration proposals and one of the things he wants to change in in our current immigration policy is to create a points based system where based on economic status or other things that we think would benefit the United States will give people points and people with higher points will be more likely to be to come to the United States but in doing that he wants to get rid of our old policy of allowing uh, immigrants here to sponsor wives or children bringing family members over to the United States. And I have to wonder about that because it seems like that could be problematic to encourage lots of immigration to the United States, but not allow them to bring immediate family over for long periods of time. And I wonder if you think that might be a harmful policy to encourage lots of single people to come here, but not encourage them to have their families to have that kind of stable structure. Well, I, I think um, uh, the, the first thing probably to think about in terms of uh, President Trump's proposal, what, a week before last, when it was, um, is to some extent he's putting out a position from which he can negotiate, and he's looking at this in, in, in front of the election. So uh, I would probably, you know, it, and we haven't seen a lot of the details yet. So, I mean, I think the, the 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 position prior that or that I've always understood them to have is that what we do need to do is draw a line between um, immediate family, which is say spouses and children, and extended family. Right right now, there's no distinction at all. You can you can uh, this is what causes this this massive multiplier effect hmm. uh, because you can bring in you know aunts and uncles and extended family and that kind of thing. So. You know, I think the the broader print, the, the question uh, is: Should there be any um, uh, should there be any distinctions at all, uh, or should it just be can you bring in and, and sponsor anybody in your extended family? Um, 
I, I think what they want to do is they want to they want to narrow it down so it's essentially the nuclear family. Um, and I think that's probably the right place to be. Right now, what do you think in general of the idea of having a merit-based uh, system of immigration? It, it seems to me, at face value, a good idea that because um, I know b apart from family members being able to um, claim other family members that are overseas uh, to try to get them to be uh, citizens also, that seems to be a, a defensible position. However, this lottery-based system, um, at face value, that seems to me like an absurd idea that mm -hmm. you would have a, a lottery in, in a country and whoever wins that lottery gets to come to the United States. Right, um, right. That seems to me absurd. Well, um, I, I, again, it, go, it, it goes back to this question. Does everyone have a right to be an American? Right. Um, and if the answer is yes, then we should take as many as we pop possibly can. And, and, if, and if you can't take all of them, then the only fair way to do it is, you know, randomly. <laughs> right. Uh, which is why that lottery thing was created in the first place. And, and that really is an absurdity, both in terms of uh, how we understand the principles of the regime, but also as a, as a matter of course, right? Uh, I mean, common, in, a, a common sense way to look at immigration is that, okay, we're, we're going to have immigrants, um, we should have them in a way that uh, serves several goals. Um, one of those is is we should bring in immigrants that can assimilate and that will assimilate, um, and we should you know and that's that that opens up a whole bunch of the things to consider in terms of rules, right? We want to, we don't want to bring people in here. There'll be wards of the state. Uh, we don't uh, we don't bring in criminals. We don't be bringing people with records. Uh, we don't bring in people that uh, are so radically opposed to our beliefs that uh, they're not willing to uh, swear allegiance to this country. Um, so that's one set of things. Uh, but then why in the world wouldn't we then uh, want to have people who to come here who wanted to come here um, to be citizens as opposed to not if we had the choice and wouldn't we want those to come here that bring with them not only a desire to be an american which means they want to also assimilate uh... but also the kinds of skills uh... that will be good for them so they can flourish in this country but also good for their fellow or future countrymen um, that all seems to make sense to me and i would add a third category which is yeah, you're right. The random thing is is absurd, but the way the the way uh, America can show its um, its openness is we have other categories for those that are persecuted, uh, for those that actually have cause to seek the protections of America, right? And that's that's what the Statue of Liberty really means. Doesn't mean anybody ever could come here, but it does mean that that uh, those who are escaping persecution uh, and uh, situations that uh, we can help to protect them from, uh, we'll also have some room for them, too, as, as much as we can. But, again, it's, it doesn't mean that we can't have some sort of rational decision-making process by which we figure all those things out. Right. So, yeah, the principle seems pretty clear. You want people to come here who want to be Americans, who believe in America, who will have the capacity to thrive here. But it come, becomes really difficult when you talk about, I think, the details. And one of those issues, of course, that has come up a lot in President Trump's administration is Muslim immigration. And even uh, a U.S. Cardinal, Cardinal Burke, recently said that it was patriotic to not necessarily want large-scale Muslim immigration in Europe or the United States because Islam doesn't fit well with the principles of, of say, Europe or, or Western culture in general. And that's one of the things I'm wondering, because we talked earlier about religion. What kind of, is there a kind of religion or what kind of ideology do you need to come here? And how do you, what do you think about those tricky questions, those questions of, say, Islam, and how would you make a judgment as to whether Islam is compatible with, say, Western values, and even then, considering divisions within religions like Islam, how would you determine right, right. individuals? Right, because it was interesting that the founders, I think, um, you know, they extended, I, I think Washington extended citizenship or invited to become part of our political community to 
I think Jews who were the mm-hmm. first to become citizens of a country uh, was the United States. Uh, invited Catholics, which at the time was sort of a tricky <laughs> subject. Um, right. So how how do you think about those issues that Lynette mentioned? Well, I, I, I think at least in broad terms, you think about the way the, the founders did, right? I mean the um, I mean, take the, the the Catholic question, which in many ways was uh, the hardest, which is to say these are here are religious believers who actually um, have some kind of allegiance to a foreign uh, leader, a, 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 a foreign head of state. I mean, the, the Vatican technically is a separate country, and the Pope is a head of state. Uh, how does that work? Uh, right, I mean, uh, it's it's kind of anarchical. It's um, you know, it's please, it's the one true church. Right, there's all sorts of problems. Right, but you think through how it worked out uh, after a while. There was this whole Americanist debate in the 19th century, uh, and what happened is that, and in, in, in the, the Catholics in Europe actually were not exactly pro-American for a long time. Mm-hmm. They had doubts about America because they thought America was this kind of radical Enlightenment experiment. Uh, but what worked out over time was that um, the the uh, Catholics uh, who came to America assimilated in a way that they came to understand the meaning of America, which has deep intellectual roots in the nature of things, which was compatible with their religion. Uh, but they also themselves came to understand, to have a deeper understanding of what uh, it meant to be Catholic in uh, a kind of liberal democratic regime, uh, which was that there, you know, was, essentially they, they learned a proper understanding of the separation of church and state, which meant doctrine and lawmaking, not necessarily religion and politics, right? right. A, a question we still work on today. Right. Fast forward to today, I mean, with, with the Muslims, um, yeah, they, they need to figure all that out. I mean, uh, the founders, there's a couple places where Washington and others talk about Muslims. Uh, they're not against Muslims. They, they think they should be Christian. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, but the more important thing, the same way they talk about Catholics or Jews, um, they need to come to understand the principles of America. And the, the key problem with the, with, uh, the Muslim faith uh, in Islam is which and Islam needs to figure this out is to what extent does Islam as a religion recognize a realm of religious liberty and in the fight essentially between the extremist and the and the moderates is is over that precise question right uh, isn't it interesting that we have had Muslims uh, in America for a long time uh, and indeed those who have been in America have assimilated quite well until relatively recently, because there's been a radicalization of, of, of uh, Islamic thinking in uh, certain parts of the world that has now been immigrating into Europe, and to some extent has slightly, but not so much yet, started influencing uh, America. Uh, but the problem with the radical Islam view is that it doesn't recognize religious liberty. Anybody who's not a Muslim is an apostate. Uh, and that's not compatible in principle with the regime of of Republican government, having nothing to do with their faith, other than the fact that you know uh, that that their faith is not uh, is not willing to recognize and allow it to exist those of other faiths. And so, yeah, that's a problem. Which you know, I, do you do you cut off? Do you not allow any Muslim immigration? I'm not sure that's the answer. Do you perhaps, uh, are, are you leery of, or maybe do you cut off immigration for particular countries? Um, that might be the prudent thing to do, to go back to your, back to your word. These things are best handled by a, kind of a prudent accommodation. And then setting up and insisting upon the, the rules of assimilation, the methods, the processes of assimilation, so that it solves that over time. The problem we have today is if you don't insist on assimilation, and it's just a binary, you know, go, no go, and your only choice is either you allow them to come here or you don't, that's not the right choice. Right. Yeah, I think a huge problem uh, is something that we see happening in uh, Ilan Omar's district, right? We have um, 
the country accepting large numbers of refugees and uh, sending all those refugees into very small areas uh, where they all stay together. Therefore, they form these new communities that refuse to assimilate because they are, you know, it's just taking one group of people from one part of the world and putting them in another part of the world and therefore they're going to keep their culture and their way of life um, and, and that becomes a problem uh, with refugees, like I mentioned, but it also becomes a problem when you have the amount of illegal immigration that we have right now. And as we were talking on the first uh, segment of our show, uh, that violates the consent of those who have set up laws uh, in order to come to the country. We are, like we like to say, a welcoming country, uh, but you have to follow the laws that the people have set up in order to come to the country. And illegal immigration is, is a big problem on that. Um, so w what do you think of the way that President Trump is handling this situation? He seems to be going after illegal immigration while at the same time trying to reform uh, legal immigration. But it, with the way that the Congress is split right now, uh, do you think this is all grandstanding or will anything come out of it? Well, I mean, I mean, I mean look, I think... Um to your last point first, just to dispense with that, with that because it's easiest. <laughs> yeah, you're you're in a divided government, and and basically, you know, nothing's going to happen between now the in the election. But I, I think that this is a way to frame the debate going into the election, hmm. um, and that might That's be the point. best thing to do. Uh, he's he's President Trump offers a, another alternative, right? We've gone through several attempts at what, what we refer to as comprehensive immigration reform. And the, the, the assumption there was always, well, you've got to put everything into the deal. And then we all agree and we go forward. And those are always terrible pieces of legislation. And I fought against all, all, all these last, the last major ones. Um, tr Trump's trying to do something different. He's, he's insisting first, and he's right about this, is that, uh, look, uh, we, we have lost control of immigration into our country. Um, and that's, uh, you know, it, it violates the principles uh, of consent, for sure, but also just it violates the whole notion of the rule of law. We, we do not control it anymore. And first thing we have to do is get control of it. Uh, and then we can talk about and consider various avenues and ways to talk about the legal process which is kind of the second half of it. I, I sometimes wish he'd talk more about the other, the second part of it, because I think just rhetorically, you know, talking about security uh, as as primary and significant as I, as I is as it is, I think it's also very important to maintain the the moral high ground of how uh, immigration is good and and properly understood is actually quite American. Um, and I think it would be better, I think he should talk about that a little bit more uh, to complete his argument. But I think he's right on focusing on security first. Yes, yeah, so one sort of related to that question of securing the border and how we deal with the influx of illegal immigration has to do with the recent uh, case that hasn't been quite decided yet as to whether you can ask a residency question in the, in the new census. Uh, because, of course, we just count everyone who lives in a state currently and that determines apportionment within uh, the House of Representat Representatives. What, <laughs> the, and the legal immigration has a lot to do with this. So what do you think about this policy? Is that, is that how the census has to work? Uh, can't, could we exclude people who aren't here legally from the census to maybe uh, tip scales a little bit in, in states like uh, California versus uh, some maybe states like up here in the Midwest, Michigan or Wyoming? How how do you see this immigration question tying into the new census that's coming up and the idea of how we we determine votes and who gets to vote and all of that? Well, I mean, I mean, I mean, part of it is um, with with many aspects of this question, uh, and, and, and again, here we we can evoke this question of, of of prudence. I mean, we have had this the the current regime we have immigration regime we have has been has been building for 50 years now, right? It goes back to the uh, legislation in the, in the 1960s uh, that changed the nature of our, our immigration system. And then and we've tweaked it here and tweaked it there, such that at, at this point, we're pretty far down a path, uh, down a bunch of different 
paths or, or rabbit holes, if you will. Um, and so if you twist, if you change one piece, you got to think through all of its implications elsewhere. So look, putting a, putting a, a question on, on the census exam, uh, census uh, taking it, I think it's absolutely appropriate, if not uh, in many ways a requirement uh, to, to know that information. But the battle really is, you know, they're thinking about what does this mean, not just for apportionment, but, you know, uh, money, welfare money, um, other money going to states from the federal government, um, hospitals, you, you, you name it, right? Because the effect over time has been to muddle the distinction between citizens and non-citizens. And any, any attempt to get better control of, of a, uh, the immigration system, even if it's for the purpose of encouraging citizenship and immigration to citizenship, you can't blur those distinctions anymore. And so you've got to start drawing lines, even if you want to be liberal about those lines, even if you want to be accommodating about those, but you're still drawing lines. So, you know, this is always the problem. Where do you start? Uh, who goes first? Um, where do you draw those lines? And the problem now is if you draw any line, it's a fight. And, you know, I, I, think, uh, I think in order to get going again and start moving down a path towards a reasonable immigration policy, which means a policy which actually welcomes people uh, into the process of assimilation and naturalization, uh, you've got to draw those lines. It's a, it's a prudence is, 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 is what's required to, you know, prudence will dictate where you start, where do you pick the fights, how do you start going down that path. I, I think the census is a, is a great one uh, to do. I think probably at the end of the day, I, I think they'll, they'll win that uh, on the legal front um, because it's clearly, there's nothing illegitimate about it other than it opens up all these questions about, other aspects uh, centering around uh, immigration and other aspects of the modern administrative state. And on that helpful uh, and hopeful note, we're going to go ahead and uh, <laughs> end our episode today. Dr. Spalding, thank you so much for being with us. We, we hope to have you sometime again. Yes. Great. It's great being with you guys. Good luck. Thank Thanks. you. <laughs> yeah, that was good. I'm glad we got to talk to Dr. Spalding. Immigration is such a, a valuable and important topic, and there's so many facets to it. It's very complicated. Right, and I think what's interesting about talking about immigration is that that's a, a, an aspect where prudence really comes to play because... You know, it's your immigration policy is going to necessarily look different if it's you know eighteen hundred or if it's uh, two thousand and nineteen, because the amount of people that you need to let into the country will change depending on how many people are already in the country. Uh, while at the same time, there are certain things that shouldn't change. Yeah. Certain principles like assimilation. Mm -hmm. You need to be able to maintain a people. You need to be able to maintain. Uh, a, a culture because those things are necessary for uh, a regime to maintain itself. Yeah, absolutely. I think the founders understood that. And exactly how we determine that, that's a hard question. And we'll, that's why it should be left up to the voters and not the courts to right. determine this. Well, you're listening to, you've been listening to Citizen Talk, the show that's restoring prudence to politics. I'm Juan Davalos. And I'm Lynette Grunvig. And this is Radio Free Hillsdale 101.7 FM. And you can also hear us on SoundCloud or on your podcast app and uh, just and on search YouTube now and on YouTube yeah, oh that's right YouTube. so you <laughs> just search either on YouTube or on your podcast app citizen talk one word and you can listen to all our episodes and check us out on Facebook and comment on anything you'd like to discuss we'll see you next week